I'd like to actually start with my acknowledgments. This work was supported in very small part by NIH. Uh, it was actually also supported by Cornell University because one of my collaborators, hmm, Jason Locasal, is a new faculty member at Cornell who was given setup funds to get his lab going. And, uh, but I would say that uh, actually most of this study was funded by the patients themselves who defrayed the cost of their exercise tests. Now in the US, in order to get disability benefits or insurance benefits, one also ne often needs to prove that, they, that you are sick. And so the patients uh, came to do the, uh, the tests I'm going to be describing uh, in order to uh, prove that they were actually ill. Uh, and all of the exercise uh, physiology tests I'm going to be describing were done in Betsy Keller's lab at Ithaca College, which is about a 15 minute drive from my laboratory at Cornell University. So as I think almost everyone here knows, uh, MECFS patients have a problem with post-exertional malaise. Effort that would not be difficult for a healthy person uh, often will induce an exacerbation of symptoms. And this doesn't happen in other illnesses. And I'm sure there are a number of you out there in the audience who are going to be sick the next few days or sicker as a result of being here at this meeting. So why is that? Is there any way that we can measure what's happening uh, during post-exertional malaise? Well, one way to monitor this is to use a cardiopulmonary exercise test. This can measure your aerobic capacity. The system that Betsy Keller's lab uses is a stationary bicycle that has increasing resistance each minute. For those of you who work out, you know, you can set the different resistance on your, on your bike to, to, uh, uh, to make it more and more difficult. So every minute the resistance increases so, and, so that it becomes harder and harder to pedal. And finally, both healthy individuals and CFS uh, patients will have to stop uh, pedaling because they'll, uh, you know, not be able to go any, any further. Now, you can measure in doing this the maximum heart rate that someone can reach, the maximum oxygen consumption, the ventilatory threshold, the maximum workload, and the respiratory exchange ratio. And I'm going to be explaining what those mean in, in the next few slides. Uh, uh, so these CPET results, I'm referring to these tests as CPETs, are widely accepted as valid and reliable. And a number of different American scientific organizations and medical organizations accept uh, a standard way of doing these tests and accept them as, as being valuable, uh, va valid for measuring someone's aerobic capacity, their anaerobic threshold, all of those other features. And in healthy individuals, the CPET test is reproducible within six or seven percent. Now this has been studied a number of times and well documented. If somebody does the test the next day or the next week, they're going to have the same results if they are healthy within six or seven percent variation. So uh, after a single CPET, what happens to uh, people who have MECFS? So after a single CPET, MECFS patients have been variously reported to have the maximum oxygen consumption ranging from anywhere from 30 to 91 percent of either the predicted value, you can predict what you sh your VO2 max should be if you're a healthy individual at, at a certain uh, age and a certain gender, and uh, or the, some of these papers used a healthy control group and found that the MECFS patients could only do 30 to anywhere from 30 to 91 percent. Now for adolescents, uh, they do a little bit better, 85 to 90 percent of healthy controls. Now obviously the people doing these tests are not people with severe ME like we heard about last night, uh, but there, some of these patients who are doing the tests actually do have uh, moderate uh, ME and many of them are housebound so it's not these are not just the mildest patients who are doing these uh, tests. Now the problem with this kind of uh, single CPET test is that what happens is an MD who doesn't know about MECFS says oh you're just deconditioned you need to uh, start an exercise program and the exercise programs are, are usually those that are designed for healthy but deconditioned individuals. And then as a result of doing this, uh, many MECFS patients uh, become worse, and sometimes the, that worsening can be a very long-term uh, uh, increase in symptoms. So what does happen to MECFS patients after an exercise challenge? 
In 2007, this group from the University of Pacific, now called the Workwell Foundation, published a paper in which they documented that if a patient does a second CPAT after the first CPAT, uh, they can't reproduce their results. Now, they actually had trouble uh, publishing this paper because exercise physiologists didn't believe it. It's not something that you would expect. Uh, I remember seeing this uh, data for the first time in a poster at an IACFS meeting years ago and being really intrigued by this as an actual biomarker of the illness, but also as a way to study the illness. Because if you look at before the patient exercises and afterwards, you might be able to find what's happening to them, and that might tell us what's happening to them all the time, even before they exercise. So I was very intrigued. Now, this, uh, this initial report, oh, let me just mention, in contrast to, uh, to CFS patients, a number of other patient groups have been tested on, on multiple CPETs. People with horrible things, uh, also, uh, you know, end-stage renal disease, heart failure, they're able to reproduce their CPET results, unlike the CFS patients. And that's one reason that it becomes difficult to persuade exercise physiologists that uh, there's something strange going on with ME-CFS. So this initial report of this abnormal second day CPET has now been uh, reproduced by, by uh, in three additional papers, one by the same group that did the initial report. Dr. Keller has recently published some data uh, which she did before I started working with her. And then uh, a, a, a Dutch group has also reported the same results that people cannot reproduce their uh, uh, CPET results. Okay, so now how do we know that these CPET results are, are not the, the lack of reproducibility? Is it, is it possible that, that the CFS patients are afraid of exercise? They're not trying hard enough because they're worried about what's going to happen after they exercise. Well, there's an objective way to determine whether the, the patients and the healthy controls are actually uh, making their maximum effort. And that's called the respiratory exchange ratio. It's accepted by all of those uh, American societies and physicians that if, you're, if you've got a respiratory exchange ratio of greater than 1.1 and you're exercising, you are uh, making your maximum effort possible. So this is the cutoff point. You have to at least be able to do 1.1, and that's the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled and the amount of oxygen consumed. Now, can anyone here control how much carbon dioxide they're exhaling? <laughs> I, I don't think you can. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this is really an objective measure because as your effort increases, your muscles are releasing more carbon dioxide and you're having to consume more oxygen. That's what causes this ratio to uh, increase. So for many of you right now sitting in the audience, your RER is only 0.8, but if you had to walk up and down those stairs, it might have gotten to be 1.1 uh, if, if you were ill. So if there's no significant difference between the RER of ME-CFS patient on a, the first CPET test and the second C, CPET test, your effort's comparable. If you're over 1.1, then we know that you tried as hard as you could. And the patients who come to do these tests are extremely motivated because they want to know if they can document their disability. So let me just uh, describe a couple other concepts that are needed to understand this lecture. One of them is VO2, which is the volume of oxygen consumption per minute. Now, it's known from many studies on healthy people that you need uh, specific rates of oxygen consumption to do specific tasks. You can look this up on a table. So, for example, I'm standing here talking to you, and I'm going to need a particular VO2 in order to do that, and I could look up on a table to see what my VO2 has to be in order to be able to do that. I'll also need a VO2 to be able to go out there quickly, run down the stairs, uh, and I can look that up, too, on, on tables. So... Um, the VO2 max is the maximum oxygen consumption, and that, that indicates your level of aerobic physical fitness and your functional capacity, your ability to do things like stand up here or run down the stairs, and, and uh, you have to have a certain VO2 max in order to be able to do that. Now, the ventilatory threshold, I'm not going to go into detail, but it, essentially it's a way to measure when your anaerobic metabolism begins to be used. And your anaerobic metabolism is less efficient than your aerobic metabolism, and you start accumulating lactic acid. And at, at some point, say you're uh, you know, sprinting or you're you know, running, you're going to have to stop. You just won't be able to continue uh, because you've, you've uh, 
uh, used up your ability to uh, utilize your anaerobic metabolism. So all of these CPET tests, as I mentioned, were done in Dr. Keller's lab. And uh, this, is her, this is her building. This is her actual setup. And this is an individual doing a test. And you can see it, the data, the, their, how, you know, the, their gas exchange is being measured, their heart rate, uh, everything objectively being measured in, in this computer system. There's no way to really fudge the results uh, uh, in, this, in, in this system. So uh, she has healthy subjects who are screened by questionnaires to identify sedentary subjects, or people who are out of shape, who are healthy. And then the patients were sent to her by physicians who know about how to diagnose ME-CFS. OK, and I'm now first going to show you what happens when an inactive control who's out of shape does, these, uh, does this exercise. Uh, and I'm going to be showing tables like this, so uh, they're actually easier to, to look at than you might think. So this is the load. This is the increase in the power that you need to pedal that bike. It's automatically increasing as you're taking the test. So it's going to go from uh, uh, 0 up to 120. In this case, this person had to stop when it got up to 120. This person's VO2 increased from just 3 up to 19 at the point they had to stop. And then their RER got well over 1.1, so they were doing their maximum work. Their heart rate went from 76 to 185, so you know they're obviously doing a lot of work. And as what normally happens, their blood pressure went up, too, from 110 to 160. Now, on the second day, their maximum uh, oxygen consumption was, was very close to what it was on the first day, you know, uh, quite close. Their heart rate was within one beat at the point they had to stop the second day when they had to stop the first day. And their blood pressure went up both days to very comparable amounts. So this is really reproducible results. And in fact, uh, it was a 1.8% decrease in the VO2 max that's within the range of normal variation. And, and the anaerobic threshold, which I'm not showing on the chart, but I'm showing below here, uh, was there was a 7% decrease. Again, that's within normal variation. So that's not, that's not really significant. So this is what an, an inactive normal control looks like. What I'm going to do now is show you three different uh, individuals who came to do the test and had three different responses to exercise. The first one is someone that uh, Dr. Keller refers to as someone with a physiological anomaly. So uh, their RER on both days was, was uh, over 1.1. So we know they were doing their maximum effort on both days. But on the second day, after doing this first exercise, they were only able to get to 19, while on the first day they were at 25. And in fact, there was a 25% decrease in their VO2 max. And there was a 27% decrease in this person's anaerobic threshold, as objectively measured by this test. Now this, again, is something that if you show a standard exercise physiologist who knows nothing about MECFS, they're going to say, your equipment was broken. That can't possibly be right. And in fact, Betsy Keller told me that the first time she did a test on an MECFS person, she thought, maybe my equipment's broken. <laughs> but then she checked, and it wasn't. And so uh, she's now tested many people. And uh, this is not an unexpected result. OK, now here's a person with an anaerobic anomaly. So uh, again, this individual uh, got above 1.1. They were doing their maximum work both days. They actually reproduced their VO2 pretty well. You know, that's, that's not bad. That's within you know, normal range. But what they couldn't reproduce was their anaerobic threshold. Now, on the first day, this, this uh, this individual could have been standing at her sink washing dishes, and she wouldn't be using her anaerobic, you'd begin to be using her anaerobic metabolism doing that. On the second day, uh, the decrease was so large, the 39% decrease means if she was sitting down at dinner, eating her dinner, she'd be using her anaerobic metabolism. So uh, this really shows uh, the incredible uh, decrease in, in functional capacity that occurs when, uh, when uh, someone is undergoing post-exertional malaise. Now here's an interesting patient, a different type, uh, someone with an autonomic d dysfunction. And uh, he also uh, got up to 1.1 on both days. But you can see he stopped on the second day a lot sooner and only got up to 21 as VO2 max while he was 41 
over here. And the reason probably that this person was unable to do more than this was that his blood pressure never went up, which is really un you know, obviously abnormal. You're, if you're cycling, your blood pressure is supposed to go up, and it did go up on the first day, as it does in normal people. But after induction of post-exertional malaise, he did all of this, and his blood pressure never went up. Now, on the first day, this guy seemed to be in pretty good shape. He could have actually run an eight-minute mile without using his anaerobic metabolism. But on the second day, all he could do was uh, carry groceries upstairs, uh, uh, and uh, you know that would be his total uh, functional capacity would be carry groceries upstairs, not run an eight-minute mile. So this was a 49% decrease in the VO2 max. And this, this is then a third type of anomaly that Dr. Keller has seen. So this brings to mind these, the following questions. One is, what are the subgroups of post-exertional malaise detected in the second CPAT? They're obviously, people are not obviously, uh, they're obviously not the same. Uh, we have one person with both VO2 max and anaerobic threshold reduced, one person with just the anaerobic threshold reduced, and then another person whose blood pressure uh, didn't increase and therefore their VO2 max went down. So we would like to know what the frequency is in the MECFS population of each of these subgroups. Now one of the problems is those papers that have been published, they, there were less than 50 patients in every, of those, every one of those studies. We really need a much larger number of patients to be tested in order to uh, find out what is the frequency of the subgroups and if there are in fact additional subgroups that I haven't even shown you. Now, my lab has been interested in trying to find out whether this post-exertional malaise could be correlated with particular changes in signaling molecules in the blood. Maybe we can figure out what causes post-exertional malaise, or at least what the result is of post-exertional malaise. And also, we'd be interested in finding out about metabolites that, that uh, may change between the first and the second uh, CPET. So, as I'm uh, sure many of you are familiar with the following symptoms. These symptoms look very much like MECFS, and this, these can be brought on if you give someone a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So one hypothesis that a lot of people have had is that maybe pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, increase following exercise, and, and that would be the uh, explanation. But if you look at the literature, actually, there's quite a variation in the data on, on cytokines in people with MECFS. And, I don't entirely understand why that is, but um, I will show you our data. <laughs> now, uh, this is a pilot study, uh, and w in this study we had uh, 27, uh, 29 patients, 22 female, 7 male patients. Controls, we only had 7 female and 2 male controls. So one problem with this study is we don't have enough controls. Uh, and, uh, but, um, uh, we have all the patients who are in the study exhibited post-exertional malaise as objectively measured by their uh, CPAT. And I'm just going to describe now the average of the data of all the patients in the controls. I was showing you individual data. This is the average of all those patients in controls. So on the first day, uh, uh, the first CPAT in the patients, they, they had a lower VO2 max than uh, the controls did on the first day. And that's probably partly because not only uh, that the controls actually that we have at this point, we like to get some more, are somewhat younger than the, than the uh, patients. And so we don't have a perfect control group here. But one thing we do know is that uh, as expected, the controls did not show any decrease, significant decrease uh, in their uh, uh, VO2 max, while the CFS patients did show a significant decrease in their VO2 max. And again, the anaerobic threshold for the MECFS subjects was significantly lower uh, than uh, for the uh, controls, and also it significantly declined in the patients, but it wasn't significantly uh, declined in the controls. What this is showing you is that unfortunately we don't have a perfect uh, uh, control group but that, our, that at least Betsy, Betsy Keller's equipment is working properly. Now, uh, so uh, we then measured the plasma cytokines using this technology, and we measured levels of 10 cytokines. Now, even though we don't have a control group of healthy people that's adequate, we can compare 
the MECFS people before and after exercise. That's a valid comparison. They're serving as their own controls. And the healthy people are also serving as their own controls before and after exercise. Those are valid comparisons. I'm actually going to show you a few comparisons between the MECFS and the controls, but you'll have to take that with a grain of salt since we don't have age-matched controls and we don't have significant numbers of controls. But um, nevertheless, the, the, the comparison before and after exercise within each group is valid. So when we looked at these five cytokines, we saw some increase, but it wasn't statistically significant. So I'm not going to describe them any further. I'm actually going to describe three of the more interesting cytokines that we saw changes in. And uh, so this is IL-2. And uh, the IL-2 levels were lower in the patients bef uh, for exercise. Uh, again, grain of salt. But uh, what's interesting is the I IL-2 levels uh, decreased in both patients and controls after exercise. Now, IL-2 is of, in of interest because it is important in the regulation of the immune system, and it can be associated with autoimmune disease. Now, uh, here's another one, IL-1-RA. And this, this, uh, the levels of this significantly decreased after exercise in the CFS population. But in the control population, the levels significantly increased. And this resulted in a considerable difference between the controls and the MECFS uh, patients. Now here's IP10. IP10 decreased significantly after exercise in the CFS population, but in the controls, it remained the same. So again, we have a difference. This is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's also increased in autoimmune diseases. So to, summary, to summarize the cytokine data, the IL-2 levels were lower in the MECFS patients before exercise, and they decreased in both groups. While for IP10 and IL-1RA, the, what happened in the control group was different than what happened in the patient group. And this obviously merits further study. Now, this abnormal immune response in the MECFS patient is interesting because these three cytokines are linked to autoimmunity. But of course, as I mentioned, we need additional subjects that are age-matched uh, in order to increase the statistical power of this and also eliminate the age-related uh, differences. So what about plasma metabolites? This is the expertise of Jason Locasau, our collaborator. Uh, he is uh, a new faculty member, and his postdoc, Xiaojing Lu, uh, was instrumental in gaining these results. Uh, he uh, is uh, partly responsible for developing the method to look at 300 polar metabolites uh, using, using this uh, equipment. And uh, he, he normally applies this to study cancer, but I, he was persuaded to have a look at some of our MECFS samples. So the previous reports of metabolites in MECFS versus controls have mainly focused on a fairly small number of molecules. So someone will think, maybe this is the molecule that's different between MECFS and controls, so I'm going to check that particular molecule. There have not been, these, that's called a targeted approach. There have not been a, 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 a large and tar untargeted survey of this many metabolites reported at this point. There was, at the recent IACFS meeting, a report from a Japanese group that looked at 28 different uh, metabolites and, and uh, mainly, mainly amino acids and found some differences, but no one's actually looked at 300. So the question is, what happens in our, uh, in our uh, patient group? Now, one of the problems is without adequate numbers of controls, all we could, we took just 17 MECFS patients before and after exercise. And the purpose of this experiment was really to see, are we gonna see any differences? Uh, because, but we can't, draw many conclusions without a control group because it is known that if uh, healthy people exercise, their metabolites will change. So what happened in the MECFS group? We got 380 metabolites detected and 52 were significantly different at, at uh, a significance level of 0.05. There were actually 22 that were highly different at an even better statistically significant uh, uh, number. However, the problem is, as I said, we don't have the data for the healthy control group. So uh, until we can get enough healthy uh, controls to, to do the test, we, we won't be able to draw too many conclusions. However, I will mention one result, which is that there was a two-fold reduction in several acyl carnitines following exercise. 
And it's known that carnitine is important for mitochondrial oxidation of fatty acids. And carnitine metabolism has been studied in healthy controls. So this carnitine levels before and after have been reported in this paper, and they did not go down two times in, in these healthy controls. Now, of course, we would like to have our own controls, make sure we're using the same methods. But this is sort of suggestive that we'll be able to find some differences if we can do some more analysis. So lacking enough people who exercised, we decided to go ahead and do a pilot study just comparing people before they exercised at baseline because we did have uh, uh, 18 female age-matched patients uh, that were age-matched with 18 healthy controls. And their age range ranged from 43 to 68. Um, and we could examine their, uh, their uh, metabolites. So we looked just at, uh, at these 300 greater than 300 polar metabolites, and we found that 83 differed significantly at, at uh, 0.05 significance. Now these are age-matched controls. This is valid data uh, and very interesting. And uh, of course, we would like to expand this to additional numbers uh, of uh, samples. And most of these metabolites were higher in the controls than in the CFSME patients. And again, I'm just going to show you one example of such a metabolite that was different. And that is that the MECFS patients had twofold lower acetylcarnosine than controls. <coughs> now, this is carnosine. This is not carnitine. They're two different compounds. Well, what's interesting about uh, carnosine is that there actually has been a study of uh, the effect of carnitine, carnosine tri treatment on Gulf War illness. And you just heard about uh, Gulf War illness from the first author of this paper. And in this paper, they described that the people reported cognitive improvement uh, after carnosine treatment. So the purpose, however, of doing these metabolite tests isn't to suggest some supplement you want to ta take, perhaps. But instead, the real uh, important aspect of it, I think, is to identify altered metabol met metabolic pathways in MECFS patients. So here's carnosine. This is the known pathway of carnosine. And I'm now showing you some totally hypothetical data. Suppose we found that not only carnosine was changed, but these two other compounds were also changed in, the, in patients versus controls. That would tell us we should focus on this pathway over here. And this is the sort of study that we hope to do uh, uh, and, and try to find out how, how the metabolism of people with MECFS has changed by, by doing these uh, sophisticated met metabolite analyses. So I'm now on my conclusions. I will conclude that unlike patients with other serious illnesses, MECFS patients don't reproduce their performance on a single CPET. And since this is a totally objective test, it's hard to imagine how a psychologist could explain this as, as uh, some uh, psychologically induced uh, uh, problem. And the MECFS patients' abnormal responses can affect either their autonomic or their physiological responses to exercise or, or both. So there seems to be a range of different uh, responses that in post-exertional malaise. Now, by examining these patients before and after we exacerbate their symptoms, we can gain insights into the pathology, I think, of MECFS symptoms because the patients are really being their own controls and showing what happens when they get worse. And we have a pilot study in which we have several cytokines that are altered after induction of post-exertional malaise. And we also have a pilot study that shows that MECFS patients differ from healthy inactive controls in plasma metabolites and that these metabolites are altered after induction of post-exertional malaise. I'm just going to leave up this uh, list of references in case some people would like to uh, look them up. These are ones that I mentioned during my talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have a question, if you may, please. I'm very interested in the way that this, this is working. Distinguishes between people with ME, post exertional um, exacerbation of symptoms. And I wonder how that relates to Julia Newton's work with fatigue and how there's a, a similarity of fatigue in different patients, in mm -hmm. different illnesses. Mm -hmm. Because that, those seem to me to be kind of at loggerheads somewhat. So well, I'm afraid it's almost more a, a, a question for Julia. 
Is she gone? <laughs> She's gone. She's well, not here, yeah. Well, in any case, you know, the people who have heart failure and those other diseases also do have fatigue. One thing we don't have, of course, is their plasma to test their metabolites or their cytokines. But these people who do have fatigue with heart failure and end-stage renal disease, they're still able to re reproduce their second-day CPAP really? within the range that healthy individuals. But as I said, we don't have you know, plasma from them so that we can check uh, what happens to their cytokines or metabolites. Right. So what people call fatigue is really something completely different from post-exertional malaise. Yeah, they have fatigue. They had fatigue when they started. They had fatigue when they ended. But, but this post-exertional malaise, as it is measured by the abnormal physiology, is something very different than what happens to uh, people with other diseases. Thank you.